Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing HER2 amplification and breast carcinoma. Okay, uh, so, um, RAF protein then. We got to the stage where RAF protein had been activated by this on RAS protein, which was a monomeric G protein. Okay, and we saw that RAF was going to be a serine threonine kinase. So it was going to add phosphate groups onto serine and threonine amino acid residues in proteins. Now, basically what it's going to do is it's going to phosphorylate another protein. So I'll draw this here. It's going to add a phosphate group onto another protein, which itself is a serine threonine kinase. So here's a phosphate group stuck on the side of this protein. And when it adds that phosphate group, that activates this other protein. So it was inactive before the phosphate group was act added to it, and now it's got the phosphate group added to it, it's going to be active. And basically, this is another serine threonine kinase by the name of MEC kinase. Okay, so MEC kinase. Now, MEC kinase has a bunch of other names. It's utterly full name, which I will write um, down here somewhere, is the mitogen activated protein kinase kinase. So mitogen activated whoops, protein kinase kinase. That is the full name for this MEC kinase. Um, often Therefore, you will see people take the initials of this huge great name and call MEC kinase instead by that. So they will take M for mitogen, they'll take A for activated, they'll take P for protein, and they'll take KK for kinase. So you will see people refer to this as MAP KK. So also people will just refer to it as MAP kinase kinase. So be prepared for that name as well. Finally, another name you may see is MAP2K. So MAP for mitogen activated protein and then 2K to denote that it's got the two kinases basically. Okay, all of those are the names for the same protein. This MEC kinase here. So what colour should I colour this in? Um, I'll do it in turquoise. We haven't used turquoise for a while. Okay, so this is this uh, MEC kinase enzyme that has now been activated, and it itself is a serine threonine kinase. So when it's activated, excuse me, it's going to add phosphate groups onto the serine and threonine residues of some other protein, and indeed that's what it's going to do. So it's going to activate the next protein in this cascade, which is also a serine threonine kinase. So it's just kinases add activating other kinases at the moment. So here is the next uh, protein. So it's added a phosphate group onto it, and when you act, add a phosphate group onto it, um, it's going to become activated. And this basically is the protein after which this entire pathway which we're looking at, i.e. starting at the HER2 receptor, going through growth factor receptor binding protein 2 and then SOS, uh, not PI3 kinase, we're about to look at the PI3 kinase pathway. Um, but this pathway is named after this enzyme, and this enzyme is MAP kinase, which is quite a famous enzyme. Most people have heard of MAP kinase. Right, so MAP kinase stands for mitogen activated protein kinase, and now we understand why MEC is mitogen activated protein kinase kinase, because it's the kinase for the mitogen activated protein kinase. So, um, that's the name, uh, that's what MAP kinase stands for. You'll also see people just refer to it as MAPK. Now, confusingly, the MAP can stand for mitogen activated protein kinase, and that's the intended meaning of it now. But an old name for MAP kinase was the microtubule associated protein kinase. So, microtubule associated protein kinase is another name that potentially you will see people use. Whoops, microtubule associated protein kinase. And luckily, that has the same initials as mitogen-activated protein kinase, so at least the symbols are the same. Another name that you will hear people refer to MAP kinase as is ERK, and this is why this pathway is known as the MAP kinase ERK pathway. Okay, 
uh, and UK is another name for MAP kinase, and it stands for extracellular extracellular signal regulated kinase. And if you think about it, that's what this protein is. It is regulated by extra signal, extracellular signals. So it is the extracellular signal regulated kinase, and that's what ERK stands for. Okay, so that's why people refer to this pathway, this entire pathway here, and where should I write it? Um, here, I think it's the only good space. That's why people refer to this pathway as the MAP kinase, M-A-P-K, ERK pathway. So if you hear people referring to that, that's what this means. It means this pathway descending on the activation of uh, the MAP kinase, which is also known as ERK for extracellular signal regulated kinase, which we'll draw in purple here. Okay, right. So, MAP kinase has been phosphorylated and activated by MEC kinase. And now what it's going to do is it's going to add phosphate groups onto proteins itself. And the two target proteins of MAP kinase that um, are the most important, well, that's debatable, but the two targets which I know are uh, MYC transcription factors and ELK1 transcription factors. So basically, it's going to add phosphate groups onto two transcription factors. The transcription factors of the family MYC, and they're again, just like there are loads of RAS proteins and those of RAF proteins, there are loads of MYC transcription factors. We'll keep it nice and general. So it's going to add a phosphate group onto MYC transcription factors. So we'll denote MYC in blue, I think. So mix here in blue, it's now had a phosphate group added onto it by the MAP kinase, and when it has a phosphate group added onto it, it becomes active. Okay, there we go. And another transcription factor activated by the MAP kinase is ELK1. Okay, so over here is ELK1. Okay, now we'll talk about what MYC does in a moment. We'll talk about what ELK1 does first. And the reason is that ELK1 is not a mitogen. Well, it is a mitogen, but it's not a direct mitogen in the way that MYC is. Instead, ELK1 is going to lead to the production of another transcription factor, which is then going to do a very similar thing to MYC, so we can reconverge the pathway afterwards. OK, right. So. Uh, the MAP kinase has now phosphorylated this transcription factor, ELK1, and the ELK1 transcription factor is now activated, basically. Okay, so let's discuss what transcription factors do then. So, if this is the DNA here, in eukaryotic cells, in front of every gene, you have a region known as a promoter region, which is not a coding portion of the genome but controls the expression level of that gene, uh, which is downstream of it. So let's say this is the gene, then upstream of it there will be what's known as a promoter region. So this is the promoter region. And the way the promoter region controls um, how much the gene product for that gene you actually make is that it controls uh, the affinity of um, the promoter region for um, RNA polymerase. Oh, whoops. I don't want it to move. Okay, um, so in order to actually make the gene, uh, well, in order to actually make the gene product for which the gene codes, what you need to do is you need RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter region and begin transcribing the gene, i.e. turn the gene into an mRNA copy, basically. Okay, then that mRNA will be translated into protein. Right, so in order for that to occur, the RNA polymerase has to bind to the promoter region. So the promoter region controls how much RNA you produce because it controls the affinity of RNA polymerase for binding to it, basically. So uh, what can happen is transcription factors such as ELK1 here can come and bind to the promoter region and alter the affinity of that promoter region for RNA polymerase. And they can either increase it, in which case they're known as a promoter or an enhancer, or they can decrease it, in which case they're known as a repressor. Now, ELK1 is going to increase the transcription 
of a gene uh, encoding a protein known as CFOS. So ELK1 is going to bind to the promoter region of the gene for CFOS and increase the transcription of this protein known as CFOS. Okay, now CFOS, shown here, is going to bind with another protein known as CJUN, which I'll draw here, and together what they're going to make is a phosgen heterodimer. So here we go, here's this phosgen heterodimer, uh, which I'll denote in turquoise. So this is our phosgen heterodimer. And basically, phosgen heterodimers in this way are extremely potent transcription factors. And they're going to do the same thing as MIP. Okay? So these two together now, well, both of them are going to promote the um, movement of the cell from the interphase of the cell cycle to um, the G1 phase of the cell cycle. So I will now discuss briefly with you the um, cell cycle to give you some insight into this. Okay, so briefly, uh, the cell cycle can be divided into five phases. And it's the process by which a cell goes from being one cell to being two cells. So the process by which a cell divides in two. Now, the first phase of the cell cycle here is a phase known as interphase, or I phase. Okay, and this basically is not an active portion of the cell cycle. This is the portion of the cell's life where it is not actually dividing. So, in a way, it shouldn't really be part of the cell cycle because it's, a, it's not, uh, it, the cell is not dividing. This is the portion of this cell's life from when it was born, basically, from its father cell um, to, um, to the point where it itself decides to reproduce, basically. And it can go on arbitrarily long. It can go on indefinitely, basically. Okay, then what happens is something changes. Basically, the cell receives growth stimulatory signals, and such as epidermal growth factor, and that leads to rises uh, to um, to raised levels of certain transcription factors in um, the um, cell, basically, such as MIC transcription factors and also phosgen heterodimers. So phosgen heterodimers and MIC transcription factors are going to trigger changes in the expression of proteins within the cell that will lead you from the interphase of the cell cycle into what's known as the G1 phase, or the first growth phase, also known as the first gap phase. Okay, and in this first growth phase, what happens is firstly you start producing a huge amount of proteins. Now, why are you going to do that? Well, if you think about it, if this cell is going to divide into two, if it's soon going to become two cells, then it is going to need to duplicate all of its essential proteins. So all of the enzymes involved in metabolism, in respiration, all of its receptors, all of these proteins are going to need to be duplicated. You're going to need to double your numbers. So some of that begins in G1 phase. So MIC and Fosengen heterodimers are responsible for triggering some of that um, change in protein expression, basically. Okay. In addition, you need to start making the protein uh, machinery for copying the genome. So if a cell is going to divide into two, then uh, it needs to copy all of its 46 chromosomes. So in order to do that, you need a lot of proteins that aren't usually expressed in the cell. So they're going to be made in G1 phase. Okay, the next phase of the cell cycle is a phase known as S phase, which stands for synthesis phase. Now in S phase, what will happen is uh, the uh, DNA within the nucleus of the cell will be replicated, basically. So, um, every single one of the 46 chromosomes will be, um, will be replicated. So, let me show this happening. So, you will go from having one cell um, with one copy of all 46 chromosomes to having one cell with two copies of all 46 chromosomes. Okay, so that's what happens in the S phase. The next phase is a phase known as G2 phase of the cell cycle. Now, in the G2 phase, which stands for the growth, the second growth or the second gap phase, um, what's going to happen 
is you're going to continue the noble work that happened in the first growth phase, uh, i.e. you're going to continue making proteins that you're going to need to duplicate in order to turn from one to two cells. But in addition, what you're preparing for is the next phase of the cell cycle, M phase. Uh, so coming up, what's going to happen is the cell is going to have to firstly split its nucleus into two, the process of mitosis. So let me just add in this next phase, and then I'll go back and explain what happens in G1, G2 rather phase. Okay, so the next phase of the cell cycle is known as M phase for mitotic phase, but it's really split into two portions. Mitosis, which strictly means the division of the nucleus to make two identical nuclei, and then cytokinesis, which then means the division of the cell. Okay, right, so, uh, basically, at the end of G2 phase, you're at the same position as you were at the end of S phase, as far as the nucleus and as far as the genome is concerned. You have one nucleus with uh, two copies of every single one of the 46 chromosomes. Okay, so, in mitosis, what's going to happen is you're going to divide the nucleus into two. The cell has not divided yet, but the nucleus has. And each of these nuclei will have one copy of all 46 chromosomes. Then in cytokinesis, what's going to happen is you're going to actually split the cell into two, uh, into two cells which each have one copy of all 46 chromosomes. Okay, so that um, final phase um, is known as M phase, which is the combination of both mitosis, which I've drawn in yellow here, which was a mistake because that's not going to show up, and um, cytokinesis, which I'll draw in red. Okay, right. Now, in G2 phase, uh, going back to that original point, uh, not only are you producing more proteins that you need to duplicate in order to become uh, two cells, uh, but you're also producing the protein machinery that you're going to need in order to split the nucleus in two and in order to split the cell in two. Okay, so basically, uh, the result of this entire MAP kinase ERK pathway here was that MYC and C FOS and C GUN heterodimers are going to move the cell from the interphase, from this quiescent phase, to the G1 phase, and you're then going to go through the process of dividing. So, this is one of the pathways by which um, HER2 binding to the epidermal growth factor receptor is going to trigger cellular division. Now, if you've got an amplified uh, level of HER2, i.e. the amount of HER2 receptors in the cell membrane is up, then every time you put epidermal growth factor onto the cell, then if the density of HER2 receptors is higher, the number of her, the total number of HER2 receptors which are going to get epidermal growth factor receptor bound to them is going to be greater, and therefore the signal going down here is going to be greater, so you're going to get greater activation of MYC and phosgen heterodimers, and therefore you're going to get greater activation of growth, leading to overproliferation, basically. Now, that's one of the pathways by which HER2 uh, leads to growth. That was the MAP kinase ERK pathway here. Okay, next we're going to look at the role of this PI3 kinase, which is going to activate the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway.